presentation can be heard, can I also please ask that you keep your microphones on mute throughout the session? There will be some time for questions and feedback throughout and in the end, but if you can use the hand up uh, function as well. So the spirit of our session today, so everyone's view is important, feel, feel free to say what you think, um, no right or wrong answer. And I'd like to hand you over to our guest speaker now, so over to you Paul. Great, thank you very much um, for that uh, Aisha. So I'm Paul, some of you uh, might know me, um, uh, but I uh, volunteer for MIND, the mental health charity, and I do some part-time work for my local MIND as well, um, Springfield MIND. We've had a very long relationship with Mid Counties Co-op and we, we're really proud of that and uh, it's been a true partnership. Um, the reason that I do a lot of these um, talks, whether you uh, uh, like it or not, is uh, I have some lived experience. So um, up until 2015, I worked in the... Um, uh, oh, that shouldn't happen. Uh, that's all right. Um, up until 2015, I... Um, uh, uh, oh, wait. Sorry. Um, up until 2015, I um, uh, had no real experience of mental um, ill health. And then um, uh, I was sectioned into a mental health hospital. I attempted to complete suicide on six occasions. And I spent six months in hospital um, with uh, uh, 20, 19 other males. And then since then, I've been really lucky to be volunteering with MIND. It's really supported my recovery, really, being able to help other people. And throughout the pandemic, I've been lucky to do exactly the same, um, do some support either over the telephone or face to face. So um, uh, that's been really meaningful to me. So. Um, it helps me talk to people about mental health and mental ill health in particular and not just reference it to uh, my studies as a mental health first aid instructor but also uh, reference it to the real world and to people um, uh, in there. So if we could have the next slide please. Uh, oh I think I've done that bit sorry Ma, uh, to catch you out there. So um, we wanted today to um, spend a little bit of time talking about and sharing our personal experiences um, with anxiety, particularly in the context of the pandemic. Um, the uh, Health Foundation did a report in August 2020 looking at the impact on our, our young people of the pandemic. Um, and actually anxiety was a leading factor, 60% of children, uh, young people were struggling with um, anxiety. And, and so first of all, really wanted to put it out there as to what you thought, what were your experiences, if you had any, um, of anxiety and, and the implications uh, on your mental health and well-being. You're going to be a quiet group because it's Monday evening and we haven't primed you up with too much caffeine, uh, uh, which is a good thing. So I thought I'd start here with just giving you a definition of what anxiety is. Um, it's quite interesting. So people make an assumption that their brains are there to um, really uh, want to make us happy, but that's not the case actually. Our brains are wired to keep us safe. They're two very different things. And anxiety is the brain's way of keeping us safe. So when the brain sees danger um, and thinks that we're in trouble, um, it starts to um, pump around our body um, uh, lots of adrenaline. Um, it, 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 essentially, as human beings, we're hardwired to avoid uh, anything that doesn't make us safe. So it's quite a natural human response um, 
thinking about things that might be happening in the future, anticipating uh, danger. And on the next slide, um, if you wouldn't mind, um, this kind of sums up anxiety, really. Uh, it's our fight, flight or freeze um, uh, response. And so um, when the body's pumping this adrenaline around our our body, our hearts are beating away. Uh, you, we've got increased, uh, slightly increased temperature. Uh, we're ready and primed. Everything's tensed up in our neck. We're ready to do one of these things, which is to to fight somebody. Quite uh, well, not rare, but uh, quite often we'll choose flight, which is to run away from situations, or we'll freeze. We'll want to keep incredibly still so that we don't get eaten by that tiger, and hopefully it doesn't see us. Now that's all well and good in um, the world that we when we were cave men and women uh, that worked really well but actually for us in today's modern age you know we don't really need that um uh that response but our human brain has no way of deciphering levels of danger um and so accordingly it primes our body we can't avoid anxiety um but we can manage it and um uh it is understandable why for some of us that becomes a really uh, big issue and and it's something that actually um, uh, we all have a responsibility but in particular um, uh, uh, young cooperators um, you, you might be able to spot this in a friend or a colleague uh, or indeed you know um, at school university or, or college you might see these um, traits coming out in your uh, uh, in your friends and uh, uh, social groups or in your family. And in that case, what we would ask is for people to get good support with it at an early stage. OK, the next slide, if you wouldn't mind. So mm -hmm. how is this for you? Do you feel the pandemic has reduced your social skills um, uh, or not? Uh, and we'd love to hear uh, anybody's got an opinion about this uh, this one mind always has an opinion so we, we we do have one but I'll share it with you in a bit I think I think Paul for me um, within my role um, I'm working you know with schools and colleges um, and a lot of the feedback that I've got from uh, our educational partners is that sometimes um, it's quite overwhelming um, for young people to to go back, you know, into the school, college, university, workplace, um, and also, you know, with that number of, of sort of people, it's the interaction. Um, so that's some of the feedback I found when I've, you know, talked to, to, you know, to our educational partners, and the fact that, you know, since last March, people have just been online, um, and then it's just, you know, getting it away from that and back to a bit of real life and I think that can cause people anxiety and uh, an overthinking sort of um, thing and that goes for my, my colleagues as well you know that I work in the office with you know yeah I, uh, I you're absolutely spot on with that uh, Marnie we that's exactly what we've been supporting people with um, you know we adjust don't we very quickly to new circumstances um, and communicating online like we're doing today, you know, I delivered some training last week face to face. It's not the same as delivering face to face. Um, but what's interesting is that actually me as a, you know, I, I do this training for mind all the time. Um, I, I felt a little bit apprehensive and a bit, oh, I haven't done this for a while face to face. You know, I'm not, you know, um, am I good enough? Imposter syndrome kicking in. But also, um, groups of people you know you start to get anxious about the these things completely understandable um and socializing online and through email and through social media you know is very different you lose a bit of your filter and you you say things perhaps in an email or online that you wouldn't say to people's faces and very quickly um uh it, it becomes quite uh quite challenging we do have on the next slide, though, some solutions for this. Surprise, surprise. Um, so 
actually increasing our social confidence is actually all about unfortunately uh making ourselves uncomfortable um which is actually to get out there and do it um so it's a bit like if you fall off your horse i don't know anybody who has a horse but if you fall off your horse they say get back on it straight away so it's actually maybe talking going out of your way to talk to lots of people i love number two study and mimic um, confident people. I think sometimes with my, if I do my hair right, with my, my appearance, I know who I should be studying. Um, although he's a complete buffoon, but I won't go into that. Um, so, um, uh, you know, studying and mimicking confident people often can be really helpful. Self-regulation. So, um, we love self-regulation. It's a, it's, it's where you take control of your breathing, you slow things down, you know, you find yourself maybe back at the office or day one in that queue. Um, and it's just really just slowing it down and saying, actually, it's OK that this is uh, challenging for me. It's quite understandable that we feel this way. Um, and actually, if the truth be told, everybody else is feeling this way as well. So uh, they might not be showing it, but yeah, deep down they are. Um, and so we love that um, uh, self-regulation. Eye contact is so, so powerful um, and indeed mirroring the other person's body language can be really helpful. Uh, standing tall, so get your posture sorted out. Um, and then number six is about creating opportunities. So, uh, for example, if it's about going back to school or, or college, university or indeed the office, you know, it's about thinking, well, OK, what am I going to do at break time? Am I going to isolate myself away from these people because I'm uncomfortable? Or am I actually going to try and embrace it by by maybe saying hello to people and smiling at people and, um, you know, saying to people, actually, if you reveal a bit of your vulnerability, this is really good. You could actually say, you know, this is really I, I'm finding. Are you not finding this quite uncomfortable coming back to to school or to work after after all this time? You'd be amazed how people respond really well to those sorts of questions. And if they see you, some of you, your vulnerability, they start to really open up to you and engage with you. And then number seven, this is something we're really bad at as human beings. We always expect the worst, don't we? We always think the worst is going to happen. But actually, um, uh, the research all shows that if we expect success, we actually get it. If we predict uh, uh predict disaster, we tend to get that as well. And and so the science behind that is if we start expecting, that actually, yes, it will be difficult to go back to school, go back to the workplace, but uh, I can do this because, you know, I, I know I can overcome this. Um, uh, you'll be amazed how your mind subconsciously starts to think, actually, you know, I'm going to be all right with this. So uh, those are seven things to increase social confidence for you. Uh, on the next slide, this is uh, a bit more nuanced about how um, asking the question, has lockdown changed us permanently? Has it changed our personalities and social skills? And I don't know whether anybody feels that they have changed as a result of um, uh, the pandemic. So um, when we um, uh, study this on the next slide, we've got some some marvelous graphs for you, which um, I'm not a graphs person, but I put this in because I think it illustrates the point. Um, this is how uh, uh, generally our personalities um, or our, our uh, personal traits um, have deteriorated during uh, the pandemic. And I, I suppose the key graph is all, but um, we talk about are we, you know, more open? Are we more agreeable, less agreeable? Neuroticism, extroversion. So generally the graph has done what we thought it would. And if you look at it, just it's been a slow decline through the pandemic. And then as we emerge out, things generally have recovered to how they were pre-pandemic. Um, but critically, um, number one, we're seeing people being more open. Uh, 
So people are actually saying, I am vulnerable and I do need support. Whereas pre-pandemic, they were a bit more reserved about that. So that's a good thing. Generally, we're a bit more disagreeable. Can you see the agreeable on this chart? Uh, my mother tells me I am disagreeable, so that's no surprise. But the bottom line is we are slightly less disagreeable, less agreeable than we were pre-pandemic. And what we mean by that is actually, uh, and this ties in um, with really our social skills, we've lost the art of, um, uh, uh, of really um, uh, connecting with people um, in a meaningful way and demonstrating emotions. So I think that's really interesting. And then something that probably should worry us a little bit um, uh, is conscientiousness. So we're less conscientious in our studies and our work than we were pre-pandemic. Now, this is really interesting. In the States, actually, um, they already have quite a lot of data on this, that actually um, uh, people are feeling less uh, motivated in their work. And um, uh, a lot of the age group 18 to 28 are actually resigning uh, and walking away from the workplace, either to set up their own businesses or into economic inactivity. What's great, of course, is your association with your co-op and mid counties because you're working for an organisation um, uh, that actually does give a damn about its communities and the people that works for it. So you're not necessarily at the behest of this massive corporate uh, beast that's about generating profit above your happiness. But I think a lot of people have been struggling um, uh, with that. OK, so on the next slide, um, I, I guess we kind of have covered this a little but um, is there anybody here who uh, um, has a view about working from home versus returning to school or the office? Um, has anybody uh, got a viewpoint on that, whether that is beneficial to them or not? Have we got any colleagues on here that have gone back to the office? Or is it a phased approach? Me, I, I'm back in the office myself. Um, I personally think that I'm less productive in the office because I'm so social and just, you know, talking to people, making cups of tea, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But then again, that might just because I, be because I haven't seen everybody in so long. So when you do see them, there's always a catch up to be had. Yeah. Um, I, honestly, I do feel a bit more productive at home, but then I know there are other people who are way less productive at home just because there's not like a teacher watching them what kind of feeling. <laughs> yeah, it's a great, um, a great point, Rory. So I think there is a, a, a little bit of a catch up because we've not been in that um, in that situation before. Um, but I wouldn't underestimate the importance as human beings of doing those catch-ups, which we haven't been having at, 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 um, at home. Um, John's also, got his, sorry, yeah, John's got his hand up for a question. Yeah. Hi, yes. Can you hear me OK? Yep, all good. Yeah, I, I'm at the wrong end of the age spectrum, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm retired. Um, but I, I, there's something that I found quite strange. I, um, I retired seven years ago and I moved about 50 miles away from, you know, where I'd been working, my university. And in the academic world, you can still, in theory, stay connected. But because I was 50 miles away, I rarely went there. But since the, the lockdown, all, you know, departmental meetings, seminars and so on, all, were all online until last week or so. So paradoxically, I felt much more connected with my in quote place of work than I did previously and and interestingly in um, certainly in that environment and I think it's probably true elsewhere um, you know when we have meetings or seminars or whatever geography is not an issue so you know we've had people join us from all over the world which clearly wouldn't have happened before and you know though there's a downside there's also 
a, a significant upside side. And I suspect when things return to, to normal, that new normal will in many cases be quite different. So certainly in you know the, the research world that I worked in, many of our meetings now will will be they'll probably be hybrid because we can have people literally from all over the world taking part. Whereas before it would only have been the great and the good, you know, the 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 who had the wherewithal to be able to fly across the world. Uh, and I'm taking it you you didn't have a private jet, uh, John, to, to do that. Correct. For you. <laughs> um, well, that that really underlines my next slide, really, um, which is that absolutely, as as you've all and and um, uh, said, again, different. We're all in a uh, we, we've all been in a storm, but we've all been in very different boats. So, um, Reese, my I have a colleague who absolutely is hugely productive working from from home um, and has thrived working from home and as uh, John was saying you know uh, has made connections across the world so it has made the world in, in terms of connectivity um, a smaller place. I actually fall into the middle camp so um, I, I, I kind of have enjoyed a little bit of working from home uh, but for me, actually, I need people. So, um, Reese, I'm one of these people who thrives on those coffee breaks, on talking with others. Uh, and so I felt quite cut off at times when I'm in complete um, uh, lockdown. And then the final one is that there is a group of people who are dying to get back to school uh, or and uh, at the office and who really um uh need that discipline 24 or for the large part larger part of their working week it's really um really key so it's, it's been different for everybody else um but i think the key message is um uh you know we all need at some point to connect with one another and understand that we've all got different viewpoints um and it's how we get to this hybrid of um uh uh keeping everybody happy yeah so, i'm the same paul so i like going into the office every now and then but i do also like working from home yeah. um then if you constantly stay at home you do sort of get into a bit of a rut i think so it is nice to uh you know go every now and then but i do see the benefits of both sides definitely yeah, yeah. I, I for the majority i think i mean uh, for us as a mental health charity, we will be doing a hybrid. There'll be some people who need our support face to face, other people who, who actually love interacting with us over the telephone or over video call because it's slightly anonymized and um, uh, and they can get to us relatively quickly. So, um, yeah, it is a mix, as, as you say, Aisha. So, OK. So critically, and I think no presentation of, of minds would be complete without telling you what on earth can you do about this P super. So how we can support ourselves um, uh, and others when we return back to normal. So um, I put some slides together now. Uh, so first of all, let's go to social media. Um, now, I... Um, uh, I smile at this. I put the TikTok thing up because I, um, in August, I downloaded TikTok. I wasn't too familiar with it beforehand, but my nephew persuaded me, he's 12 years old, to get TikTok. So I downloaded the app and I put it on my phone. And um, I didn't realise this, but I, I noticed that I was losing like an hour at a time looking at these damn TikTok videos. Um, the average user of TikTok spends four hours a day on TikTok. I can't comprehend that. That's incredible, isn't it? Four hours a day. But our key message here is about um, social media and, and our appetite for social media. Um, for some people, a very select group, social media is good. So particularly thinking about people who are um, uh, uh, struggling with anxiety and they, they can't get out of their house, then there are certain forums on social media that are quite helpful for that, that 
allow them to talk with other people, game with other people in a positive way um, and create social connections. But for the vast majority of us, social media is corrosive and um, it creates expectations in terms of materialistic wealth. It, it, we say things that we would dream of saying to people in, in face to face um, and it can be very destructive. So the first thing is to regulate your social media diet. And if possible, a bit like alcohol, we say if you can have two days a week of no social media, that's really good for your mental health and well-being. The next slide, it, we're actually really bad at this. So <laughs> we're far kinder to friends and family members and colleagues than we are to ourselves. So we treat our friends and family, you know, if they do something wrong or, uh, you know, uh, having an off day, we're far kinder to them than we are ourselves. So it's really important that we um, we look after ourselves and we're compassionate about ourselves. And, and, and we're all trying to do the best we can in, in the way that we know how. And that really needs to be uh, enough for us. Then um, on the next slide, um, I have talked about this and I will continue to talk about this and mine will continue to talk about this uh, until we're out of business and everybody's mentally well in the UK. But the outdoors is so key to our mental health. Uh, um, we, uh, we need to be outdoors. Our brains thrive on fresh air. It helps us think about stress and um, helps us process our feelings and emotions. Marnie was talking there about how, you know, people were overthinking things and, and you know, we call it um, ruminating over problems. Getting outdoors really breaks that, that loop. And there are so many studies that show, you know, with depression, it responds really well to walking, for example. Anxiety responds really well to connecting with nature. So anything gardening where we've got our, our hands dirty, that whole thing about tree hugging, there's loads of scientific studies that show uh, that being out amongst nature really grounds us and, and, and builds our levels of resilience. Um, I always feel a bit critical with the next slide because I am a bit of a um I uh, uh <laughs> I do like my espresso in the morning to get me through um but actually um caffeine has a half life of six hours um if you go to bed at 10 o'clock at night you need to cut caffeine out at 12 o'clock midday it also high levels of caffeine interfere with uh, our neurotransmitters in particular caffeine really depletes uh, levels of the uh, uh, a thing called GABA GABA and GABA is responsible for reducing levels of anxiety and reducing panic attacks so if we're drinking caffeine it really is a bit of an enemy in terms of our own natural defenses against stress and anxiety um, the next slide, uh, um, I've definitely not got the picture right on this, but uh, we talk about the importance of structuring our days. Um, and so we, um, as human beings, we do need a reason to get up in the morning. And actually during lockdown, it's been easy to sleep in or to binge on Netflix late into the night and uh, get up late. Well, actually, we are creatures of habit. And so if we get up at the same time each day and go to bed at the same time, our body loves that and actually thrives on that. It energizes us, as does goals. And so um, having little goals throughout the day to achieve and those little goals, uh, we would say as a mental health charity, don't need to necessarily be about work, but they can be about right I'm going to just go for a 10 minute walk today or I'm going to actually put that face pack on that I've been promising myself or you know I'm going to do uh, some relaxation and yoga those sorts of little goals um, help us uh, believe that we are or actually help us uh, be better people so the idea of structuring our days with goals is the only thing we should be interested about is making tomorrow slightly better for us than today has been 
Um, another slide that I've been banging on about for a long time is the one on kindness. Um, and if you can make somebody each day feel a little bit better about themselves, not only do you, of course, improve uh, the well-being of your um, uh, colleagues and friends, uh, make them feel good about themselves. You know, uh, as Jordan says um, in, in the chat about making um, uh, uh, checking in with people and colleagues, it also for us helps with our self-esteem and helps with our um, our confidence levels. And that's certainly for me recovering from clinical depression has been really powerful helping other people who are in a similar position it's not a selfless act it means i get this feedback about actually yeah i did make or try to make a bit of a difference today really good for our our mental health and well-being um, positive relationships so uh, we are social animals we do need to be around people we might get nervous about that but actually um, uh, we need those positive relationships we need to be around other people um, and uh, uh, positive people when I was in hospital what was really interesting was that actually uh, the nurses always said there was a direct correlation cor cor correlation sorry get that out of those who had positive relationships um, you know that were encouraging recovery and those who either didn't have friendship groups or um, didn't have um, uh, people in their lives that could be positive influences that were, were were actually a negative drain on them so really important for us to have that um, uh, group of people and it doesn't have to be a big group but people around us that we know we can count on that's going to help us when we're in a, a corner positive relationship I think it might have the uh, and one more. Uh, on Teams, it's always so slow, the slide changes. Um, OK, brilliant. thank you. So in terms of sleep, um, as a nation, we've become really bad at this. We've number one, we've filled our bedrooms with lots of distracting things like um, standby lights and alarm clocks. And um, we, you know, we no longer have the bedroom completely blacked out. You know, we've got street lights outside shining through and um, all sorts of disturbances, which really interrupt the quality of our sleep. This whole thing of uh, of sleep is really our computer reset button. You know, it's our switch on and switch off again, switch off and switch on again um, mechanism. It wipes the slate clean, a good night's sleep, uh, and prepares us for the day ahead. Um, there's a good study out from, I think it's Norway, showing that if you, um, you really need to turn your electronic devices off, TV, laptop, mobile phone, tablets off one hour before bedtime. Uh, otherwise, uh, those screens start to really interrupt uh, the quality of our, our of our sleep. Sleep is an important thing, and it's one of the first things in mind that we turn to uh, to support people with if they're struggling with their mental health and well-being. Uh, next is about boundaries. Now, there's a really um, brilliant uh, author uh, who is on YouTube called Brené Brown. I absolutely love her, but she talks really about the importance of boundaries to us. Um, and what we mean by boundaries is the ability to um, uh, really carve time off, time out for ourselves but also to live our life by what we think is important. So um, uh, making sure that what we value as, as individuals, we actually work to that and are surrounded by that. 
Now, boundaries comes in a number of forms, but first of all, it's about saying no and saying at one point, at some point each day, creating time for ourselves where we can look after uh, our well-being and our, our, our mental health, where we can think about what's happened to us um, and do some logical thought about it, preferably outdoors. But also uh, the ability to say no. It's interesting, as human beings, we're really rubbish at boundaries, but in order to be the best we possibly can be, uh, we do need to say no. And if something, if we're asked to do something and it, it doesn't hit, uh, connect with our values and with our purpose it's actually okay to say no it's more damaging for us uh, if we if we say yes to everything that comes our way the next slide um, is a uh, I think it's a Banksy thing that he did but um, it hope um, uh, so actually saying to people you might feel this way today um, but our emotions are very transient. Tomorrow will be a different story or the next hour will be a different story. And actually encouraging people that there is hope. Um, you've been on this presentation today and somebody who tried and, and failed to, to complete suicide six times and somebody who's been in a mental hospital for six months can rebuild their lives. You know, we can do this with the right support. Uh, offering people hope can be really inspirational. Uh, and, and and so, you know, like Jordan is saying in the um, uh, in, in the chat, you know, uh, offering people an opportunity to talk, but then saying, actually, no, you know, we all struggle. We're all trying to do our best, um, uh, uh, but we can get through this together. Really important. OK, the next slide is about comparing ourselves to others. This is a bit of a cheeky one, but nobody on this morning's rehearsal drew me up on it. So I'm going with this picture. But we do compare ourselves to others, uh, particularly men. And actually, we need to stop that. The only people we need to compare ourselves to is ourselves. So have, can we, are we today slightly better than we were yesterday or slightly better? Are we going to be slightly better tomorrow? Uh, are we going to be nicer to us ourselves tomorrow? Are we going to improve ourselves tomorrow? Um, if any of you have heard the next slide about positivity, if any of you have heard me talk before, you'll know um, uh, uh, I'm a huge fan of gratitude journaling. I've done quite a bit of work with people on a one-to-one -one basis, prisoners, all sorts of people on gratitude journaling, and it, it really worked. So, um, remember that human brain that's always scanning for uh, danger and scanning uh, the horizon for threats. Uh, gratitude journaling is a bit of an antidote to that. So it says, OK, what what can I be grateful for in the here and now? What can I be positive about? It doesn't matter how small it is. But if you start a gratitude journal, you'll be amazed. The first day you'll really struggle with it. First few days. By the end of the month, it will really be flowing easily. And what you'll notice is you'll start seeing stuff uh, in your day to day lives that's positive. You'll start noticing that stuff um, and the, the negative stuff will take less of an impact on you. Um, the next slide about guilt. Um, <laughs> this is easy to do, not so easy to uh, to, to to stop, but essentially we as human beings would kind of have this I don't know about how you feel about it but I certainly have this whole cupboard that I drag around with me full of sticks that I can beat myself with not good enough on this not doing well on this so and so doing better at that why didn't I handle that better we're, we're quite often looking back at the past and feeling guilty about that our happiness belongs in the here and now so uh, giving that guilt up means saying, OK, well, where am I at right now and in this moment? Uh, and actually what happened in the past and what's going to happen in the future? I can't control that, but I can control how I feel in the here and now. Uh, and consequently, that's what we really need to focus on. So giving up guilt really um, key to that. The next slide about um, uh, learning um our brains need to be used our brains are um uh, always hungry for 
uh, uh, learning, be that academia, be that um, uh, arts and crafts or a, a, a new language or anything like that. Learning is great because it reduces our levels of stress. Um, so uh, that's quite interesting to me. But also um, learning is great because it improves our confidence, uh, helps us overcome uh, challenges in our life. Um, and also it, it, it sort of wards off problems later on in life, like depression, like uh, it can help defend us against things like Alzheimer's developing and Parkinson's. Really key. The next one um, uh, is about podcasts. So um, the reason I love this is because you can um, you can do this and not take any action at all. Just maybe in the car or when you're out and about or maybe during your lunch break in the office or at school. You can put your earphones on, listen to one of these podcasts. You don't even really need to be listening. But the science shows that listening to positive podcasts uh, regardless of the fact of whether you actually do anything as a result of listening to it, can really help our mental health and well-being. It sort of gets absorbed into our subconscious. So a bit like the Gratitude Journal, um, noticing positivity. If our brain starts to hear positive stuff, it starts to look for the positives in life rather than looking for um, the dangers. So I, I, do, um, I do love that. The next thing is about a mental health check-in. So I don't know about you, but sometimes I can go uh, an entire week from Monday to Sunday and I get to Sunday evening and I think Monday's coming again. What on earth happened that week? You know, I was really busy, but what, you know, what happened? And in particular, it's really important for us to do a bit of a mental health check. So have I been kind um, to myself? Did I drink enough water this week? Did I take a hot bath? You know, what did I do to relax? How am I feeling? That can become quite dis disconnected in today's world. You think about you've got this mobile phone going off, the TV, the box set on Netflix. Um, some of us are watching the, um, I forget what it's called now, Squid Game or whatever it's called, that um, Japanese or Korean thing. It's really good. But we get distracted all the time. And uh, the fact of the matter is, our mental health can easily be forgotten. You know, we're worrying about everybody else, but not ourselves. Um, the next slide um, we will always go on about at mine because with mental uh, health, if it starts to deteriorate, the earlier we can get in and offer support, the better. Now, at Mid Counties, you have access to something brilliant, which is uh, grocery aid. They offer a range of supports. Um, uh, both instant and counselling and online support. Um, you've also got the Every Mind Matters um, app, which is just brilliant for support. Um, outside of those things, though, there is still a lot there for anybody struggling. So the NHS now, um, you can go and see your GP or you can um, self-refer yourself for talking therapy through the NHS. Of course, there's Mind is always there for you, as is the Samaritans. There's Wobot, which again, you can access through um, grocery aid, but actually anybody can access that now. Most um, uh, uh, most county councils are uh, have given access to residents for Wobot. But there's other stuff like Every Mind Matters, the Car Map, um, uh, Hub of Hope, and also Side by Side, which is a peer support community. Lots out there, but the earlier you get the support, the quicker you will recover uh, uh, and also the more resilient you will become. So that's, I think I've talked you to death, I think a little bit. My final slide is about um, can't get a uh, resilience by taking a pill. Life is about us looking at how we're coping making observations and making small changes. So with resilience, it's about saying, well, what works for me? Do I need to start taking a walk during my lunch break every uh, every day? Or do I need to start listening to some positive podcasts? It's an experiment and um, uh, we need to find what works for us and play with that. So um, perseverance with resilience and looking for stuff that can help us really important. So I think, uh, Marnie, if it's all right, we'll, and Aisha, we'll go for questions if that's okay. Yeah, of course. 
Great. Marnie has asked in the chat a really good question about how do you spot if somebody is struggling in the workplace? Um, so there are a couple of things with this. Um, those signs might be anything to do with change, so a change in per a person's personality. Now that might be really difficult for you to spot as we start to uh, come back from COVID because we will have forgotten people's traits generally, but people who all of a sudden will start to become socially withdrawn, who maybe were the life and soul of the party before, uh, people who, who maybe get tipped over the edge by the printer not working in the office or uh, uh, by the amount of studies they've got to do at college or, or, or at school. Those things can be uh, an indicator, um, as can people not maybe losing motivation, um, people maybe not looking after their appearance that previously did. But equally, uh, the following is true, which is as, as human beings, we're quite good at holding a mask up and pretending that we're OK. Um, and it's only once you scratch underneath the surface, you know, like with what Jordan has said about checking in with colleagues and just asking people, are, are you really OK? How are you coping? Um, these are difficult times. What's life like for you? Those sorts of questions um, can help us notice. But actually, a lot of us are really good at acting. So, uh, you know, you won't necessarily know when we're struggling because we'll we'll be putting this act on, which in itself is quite tiring. Can I ask a question, Paul? What kind of things would you write in a gratitude journal? Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> when I was in hospital and I started writing my gratitude journal, it was I have clean underwear today. Uh, you know, um, I have hot water in a shower today. Very basic things. And then it starts to evolve. So um, you might be writing that actually today I can be grateful because I woke up on time or it might be, you know, I can be really glad that I can drive a car or, you know, very simple things. Um, that seems so inconsequential, but actually it doesn't matter how small or indeed how big, uh, you know, um, Marnie, that multi-million pound bonus that you got from Mid-Counties last year, for example, you know, you could be grateful for that. But um, uh, whatever it is, writing it down changes the language your brain starts to use. So uh, our brains develop habits. And if our habit is we notice lots of negative stuff, um, we start focusing on that. And all of a sudden, all of our, our whole life becomes about that. Whereas in our gratitude journal, if we can notice the positive stuff, we respond well to that. Thank you, Paul. Um, Reese, you've got a question? Yeah, just a question for Paul, really. As someone who's experienced in the field, so to speak, what would be your honest opinion on antidepressants? Because you hear a lot of mixed opinions and just this slide on the screen now has got me thinking, you know, some people say, you know, it's something that you end up taking for the rest of your life and it helps you manage. And then other people think, oh, it's like, you know, the devil's drug and you'll never get off it. Um, I'm not personally looking at potentially taking any for myself. It's just peers and colleagues who do take them. It's a very mixed bag of opinions. Some people hate yeah. them and some people like them. Yeah, and that's our experience at mine. Some people, it fixes the problem completely. You know, within four weeks, six weeks, they've started taking them uh, and they get this hallelujah moment and it, it solves everything. For some of us, it helps you get through life, keeps us on an even keel. For other people, it doesn't work. Um, also, you've got a range of antidepressants, so you've got different types and some types work for some, but not for others. Mind's view is very clear on this. If it helps, then more power to you. So if that helps you um, get a handle on your mental health and well-being, go for it. Be informed. So on the MIND um, website, there's a, a booklet on uh, the different types of antidepressant and uh, making them work for you. But overall, um, it, the question is about um, uh, experimenting with it under the supervision of your GP um, and seeing if it does 
really uh, work for you, or it's about something else like gratitude journaling or um, uh, people are always amazed by small changes they can make themselves can actually have more of an impact on your mental health and well-being than antidepressants. Thanks, Paul. Cheers. I think, uh, Aisha and Marni, we've exhausted everybody. Can you get the next slide up, Aisha? We'll close the session. Yeah. OK, so that, that's the end of it then. So thanks, everyone, for joining us this evening. Um, and for everyone's contributions as well. So we hope the information provided by Paul um, was helpful. I know um, I did learn quite a lot there myself. Um, and like I said earlier, you can find out more about um, our other conversations on our website as well. Uh, so thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening.